You good? Brilliant. Father, I want to thank you that you wanted to do a new thing in our day. You're always doing that. And I'm asking now that as we gather around your word, as we um, look deep into your truth, would you speak? Would you uncover revelation? Would you remove our blindness? Would you heal our crippledness? Would you help us to drink deeply at the wells of your word? that would transform us for your glory and for your honor. And I'm asking this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I want to minister to you this morning. Um, and a message I'm calling, what are you carrying? What are you carrying? I was in a pastor's meeting recently about a month ago, and Ray Bevan was preaching and sharing, and he mentioned a few things that just got stuck. You know those times where you know that God is trying to speak to you? And I'm trusting that through this message today, that as you hear the word, that the Holy Spirit would take some of what I'm saying, not as what I'm saying, but what He wants to say to you, and it will get stuck into your spirit. And you've got to move that truth from the brain, from your thoughts, and into your heart. And so over the last few weeks, I have been meditating and pondering on these things and looking into them deeply. And I've realized that God is wanting to speak, has been speaking to me, but he wants to speak to us around what are we carrying. What dreams that God has put in you that are unfulfilled? What dreams are you carrying that have not been fulfilled? What plans did you have that have been undeveloped or no, not been come to fruition yet. What are you carrying? You see, the reality is, is that the enemy of heaven, Satan himself, is after what you're carrying. He's after what you're carrying in God. What God has put into you, he is after that because he wants to take it away. The bears in North, North America... After 10 months of not eating salmon, absolutely long for the moment when the salmon which have um, been swimming in the ocean now come up the river to give birth to the young so that they can swim back down into the ocean. The bears are waiting for the salmon. And after just kind of feasting on all of the salmon, you know, they just kind of like gored themselves. But then for the next few months, what they do, or the, uh, it's about a two-month season, over those times, what they do is they target three areas of the salmon. They target the brain, the eggs, and the sperm. Take a look at this video and watch how the bear actually takes a salmon, stands on it, squirts the eggs out, and then licks up the caviar. Take a look. See that? Beautiful caviar. I didn't even kill it. This is the reality. The enemy of heaven is after that which God has placed in us. The dreams, the plans, and the purposes, our future, that which God wants to do, the enemy is after. What are you carrying? What are you carrying? I've been meditating on this verse as I have been reading through an Aramaic translation of the Bible, kind of inspired by the, by the TPT as he references the Aramaic so often. The Aramaic language was the language that Jesus actually spoke. And so the Bible, the New Testament, was written in Aramaic and Greek. And we have that translation. But there is an Aramaic translation. I've been reading it. And I came across this verse uh, in 2 Thessalonians 2.17. And it says this. 
He will make your hearts a well of prophecy. He will make your hearts a well of prophecy, and He will establish in you every word and every beautiful deed. He will make you stand in it. He will establish you in it. This is the heart of God. This is God. The Father wants to make our hearts a well of prophecy. God has put our heart, and that's our feelings, our emotions, our thoughts, our desires, all of that which makes up us, that we have to love the Lord our God with all our heart. That's the first and foremost commandment, is that we are there to worship God. God is to be first in our life. First love. And so here, God into this emotional thoughts, feelings, desires, all of that, the heart of you and me, God wants to make that the birthing place of His dreams, of His plans, and of His purposes in your life. It's not a cerebral thing. It is a heart thing. In Proverbs 4.23, we know this verse well, doesn't it? It says, God your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. It's where life flows from. Friends, life and our future flows from our heart. Our hearts are the most important part of us. And it's right into our heart that God wants to birth these things, has birthed them. When I read that scripture, God has made my heart a well of prophecy. It's out of my heart that the desires and the thoughts and the, and the future plans and the purposes of God wants to birth them so that we can do, speak and do the things that God has called us to do. The problem is, that's the very thing that the enemy is targeting. What are you carrying? What are those dreams and purposes and plans? What are those unfulfilled things that have got squashed down, pushed down, or maybe even stolen? Friends, I want to tell you that God has an endless supply. He has not forgotten you. He has not written you off. His plans and His purposes still stand, and that it is... He will give us a fresh beginning. He doesn't give us second or third plan. His plan is still the A plan. He's still His purpose, and He will birth those things if we will give Him a chance. How many of you are realizing right now, and by the Spirit of God speaking to you, that there are unbirthed future plans? There are, there are desires. There are things that God has put into you. That, and maybe there's people here this morning that life has come and is, and, 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 and is maybe like a tornado has blown through your life, divorce, uh, abuse, debt, uh, many things that has come in and left you in a place where you're thinking it'll never happen. You know, is God out there? I want to tell you, friends, in that the message this morning is I want to be a disciple this morning that brings the gospel, the good news that he has still never changed his mind concerning you. One of the things that Ray Bevan said was that the devil exploits our humanity to pollute our hearts. I thought, wow, the devil exploits our humanity to pollute our hearts. Why? Because it's in the heart that God births these purposes and plans. And so right into the very place where there is this birthing of the new, of what God wants to do in you and me, what God wants to do in urban life, what God wants to do in this city and in this nation, right in there, the devil is at work polluting our humanity, sorry, exploiting our humanity to pollute our hearts. You can imagine a well. Just think of you being thirsty three, four days in the desert, no drinking. You come across a well. You put down the bucket. You draw it up, and it's just polluted. It's filthy. It's, you can't drink it. I don't believe that's what God wants for you, for me, or for the church, that we are to be a well and a wellspring of life, that the city comes and drinks deeply of God. 
God wants our hearts to be an overflow of the fresh flow of heaven. God wants his word and his deeds to flow forth from our lives. But the enemy is after those very things. What are you carrying? What are you carrying that is of God for the future and for tomorrow and for next month and next year? What are you carrying that the enemy is after? You see, the enemy will try and use our humanity to pollute our hearts. How does he do that? Well, he does it in a number of ways. The very first thing is, is that he wants to steal the worship of our heart. We should love the Lord our God with all our heart. How many of you find it easy to get up half an hour, an hour earlier than anyone else and, and get alone with God and have a devotional time? I mean, how, you just find it easy. I mean, you're just like, are you superhuman, amazing people? Come teach me how to do it. it. To me, I have to set the alarm. I have to get up. It has to be. It's a fight to do it. Why? Because it's into that very place that God wants us to put him first in the day, first in our worship. I love the Lord my God with all my heart. How many find it easy now, I know how many I find you. How many find you easy to come to church on time? Uh-oh. I know because I counted. <laughs> 80% of you weren't on time. More than that. And I go, why? It's because there's a laissez-faire kind of attitude. God, come see, consult. I'll get there whenever, whatever. And I go, you see, God... Uh, the enemy uses and exploits our humanity, whether it's, you know what, the kids or uh, time and sleeping or whether I don't like the worship, I'm only coming for the preach or whatever it is. I don't know what it is, but I'm going, you know what? The enemy is targeting that which we are carrying, and we just go, oh, whatever. I go, no, God, I'm going to never stop talking about we put God first in our day, first in our week, first in our mind. How many of you find it easy to take those 10% and give it to God and go, that's it, stick it in the face of the enemy. I'm going to put God first in my finances. Come on. It's a fight. It's a discipline. And the enemy wants to exploit our humanity. You'll get into our thought life, and we begin to think like the world. You'll get into, I, I, let me just, I can't remember them all off by heart, so I'll need to just refer you. He, he'll, he'll come into our, the worries of life that we begin. You know what he does? He'll sow doubt into your heart. Have you ever found that? It's just like, does God really love me? Just that little doubt. You know what, God, are you angry with me? There's that time where we think God is on the judgment seat, not on the mercy seat. We think, oh, he's going to judge me for what I've done. Or I'm not getting this because I've done this. And, and we begin to doubt, or we doubt his provision. He kind of like, uh, will he actually give it? And I mean, I'm right there. We, we were now in Brazil, and we were helping them do a complete um, church makeover or extreme makeover church edition um, with this church. And, and, and they needed a, a push and a shove to get into a place where they can be reaching those far from God. And they were a little bit like, uh, uh. And so when, in Brazil, most of the church buildings are white. There's just a white box. There's no acoustic treatment. The sound is terrible. You can't hear the message. Um, you feel conspicuous. It's, it, it's, there's no atmosphere. There's nothing that is making it easy for people to turn to God. And, and, and they wanted to make a change but didn't know how. So they called me. And so I went there. And I, before I went, I said to the elders, listen, uh, we have set aside 30 grand to, you know, to do this. And then I said to them, hey, just give me a... Um, uh, kind of things of what do you think you need? And I looked at their list and thought, 30 grand ain't going to do it. So I went back to elders and said, listen, could we squeeze 50? I think we can take 50. We've made provision. We can do 50. We'll be generous. When I got there, I realized that 50 ain't going to do it. And I'm standing there, and, and now we've got to buy, because their sound system was terrible. And now we've got to buy them a sound system. And I'm going, this is going to take us over the budget. This is over the, and, and I'm like, uh, and I'm going like, 
You see, I start to doubt God's provision. And I, I thank God for a generous church. I thank God for a church. And, I, and it's not about, it's you. You give your, you're giving your money to God. You don't give it to me. You don't give it to the church. You give it to God. God receives the finance. We get it, but God receives your heart. He knows the intention of the heart. But in that, the, the generosity of this church and that we've been able to do that, I just go like, okay, God, I don't know how, where, and whatever, but uh, we're just going to go for it. And you know, that morning, last Sunday morning, when the people walked in the church, so you can imagine that they had a white box, and then they got a box a bit similar to this, you know, dark walls. They thought they were going to leave, the people were going to leave the church. We put acoustic treatment all down the back. We bought them a new sound system. We bought them lights. We painted the whole building. We, and, and when people came into church, they could hear themselves. They've never heard worship like that. They've never, it, it, it's like everybody was going, whoa, and they were amazed. The pastor and his wife sat with us and said, Craig, we would have never done this. By ourselves, we managed to push them over. But here I am, going like, yeah, I was doubting. You see, he wants to, he wants to exploit our humanity, so that he can pollute our hearts. He does it through other areas, like in our words, and 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 we've just seen as we've gone through the series of Netflix and chill, how through our bodies, that through sexual sin we sin against our bodies. It's our humanity that is exploited by the enemy, and we then pollute our hearts. See, we think, ah, nothing happens. You know, we can do whatever. We can sleep around, do this, do that, do this, da, da, da. No, our hearts are being polluted. You know, we worry now. I mean, if you go to, like, everyone's on the straw issue. Like, we don't use plastic straws because we want to save our nation. A little plastic straw. But you know how many plastic straws make up the plastic in the, in the seas? And we go like just that. And you want to go, oh, this little relationship, this one last moment of sex or whatever it is. Let me tell you, that thing pollutes our heart. And God is looking for a people and a church that is unpolluted that has a wellspring of life, because he wants to spring. You know, this is what John, uh, John Piper said this. He said, um, we humans have a supernatural enemy whose aim is to, is to use pain and pleasure to make us blind, stupid, and miserable forever. Pain and pleasure. And if you think about it, it's like pretty much that's it. You know, if you are blind, stupid, and miserable, it's because of some pain, some unforgiveness, some unbitterness. Somebody did something to you that you won't forgive them, or there's something that's going on, and you're holding a grudge, or you are gossiping, or whatever through the words that are coming out of your mouth. And we are just blind, stupid, and miserable forever because we've either had too much pleasure that has not been in the right place of God, in the righteousness of God, or we're allowing pain to color our future. And I go, pain and pleasure is going to come, but man, I want to stay with a wellspring of life. I don't know about you. Are you, what are you carrying? What are you carrying? What are you carrying? What are you carrying? I want to show us this morning out of Matthew chapter 21, and this is a, a text that has been used in this church, and it's, I believe, like Jesus said, he said, out of the treasures, out of the old, um, God will bring both new and old treasures. There's truth that God has spoken into this church, and I want to remind this church, maybe those of us that have been around for a, a longer period of time will recognize this. Those of us who have joined recently will now catch a hold of this, because this is a word that God has spoken to us, and I want to remind us, because I have some dreams. We have some dreams. We have some plans. We believing that God will do some significant things, and we believing that in this season we'll be reminded of it, that the revelation and the prophecy of God is that He has made our hearts a well of prophecy. There are prophetic things that have been said and spoken, and I'm believing that they will take place before I die. It may not be through me, as you'll see, but I'm believing. And it's out of Matthew 21. Jesus is coming. It's in these final few weeks of life. He's coming to Jerusalem. He's going to die. They're going to crucify him. And he is coming. And it says there in 21, now as they were approaching Jerusalem, they arrived at a place of the stables 
It's Bethpage, near the Mount of Olives. And Jesus sent two of his disciples ahead saying, As soon as you enter the village, you will find the donkey tethered along with a young colt. You went to the village. Jesus sent them to the village, but he was destined to the city. And friends, I want to tell you is that Jesus is coming, and he's taking us out of our village mindsets, out of our village um, faith levels, out of our smallness, and he wants to take us into the city. This church is not, you know, some of my friends, they, 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 um, what's, what's the word? Um, they mock me and in turn mock us. They say, um, this is not urban life, this is nearly urban life. So you're like, why is it? Because it's like there's farms all around here, you know. Now, it's, I know it was a few years ago, but they're kind of like, hey, man, you're out in the sticks. I remember when we bought this property 20 years ago that the pastors in the city, they said to me, Craig, why are you buying a property so far out? I'm going, because I want to be in the middle of what God's doing. And you've got to be a prophetic and you hear God, and now we're in the very center. And now everybody's jealous that we have 21 acres and they can't get it. You see, 20 years ago, there was a well of prophecy. There was something that God was doing, and he was setting us up. When I walked on this property and we were going to buy it, I thought, you know what? I'm going to cut it in half, sell it, and that half will pay for this half. And God said, do not sell my inheritance. I tell you that I'm so glad today that we bought 21 acres, even though it take, costs a lot of money to look after. But anyway, <laughs> thank God for Dave. But I want to tell you is that God wants to take you out of your village and put you in a city. All right? And this is what he goes. And he says, um, and you will find a donkey tethered along with a young colt. This is a beautiful picture because here is a donkey with a dinky. All right? Here is a mom with a kid. Here is an old donkey with a new little dinky. And Jesus says to them, bring them. He says here. He says, tell them. He says, and if anyone stops you, he says, sorry, untie them both and bring them to me. Untie them both. And I want to say, this is my dream. This is what I believe that God has put within the life of this church is that I have a dream that the old and young would serve God alongside each other. I have a dream. I have a dream. And yes, I may not be in, and as we'll see, the dinky gets Jesus and the donkey just walks alongside, but I'm still prepared to be a donkey, someone in the second half of their life. And you may be in your first half of your life, and you may be a dinky. And I want to go, God wants to ride with his glory on you, but he wants to untie you first. What are you tied to? What are you carrying that is not of God? What are you tied to? What does God want to untie you from? I think there's someone here that wants to, God wants to untie you from a relationship, not marriage. That is not you're in a relationship, you're not married, but you're tied to a relationship in God. You will never get to the city and the purposes of God as long as you stay tied to that village. That person, he or she, whatever it is, is not the enemy. Just that the purposes of God for your life, you've got to let him untie you and take you away. There's a business that someone is tied to here and that you are trying and trying and trying and it's a village business. God has got a city business for you. And if you will let him untie you, he will take you to greater provision. It's your faith that has been shrunk by the enemy and God wants to give you faith and courage for a future. Amen? Untie them both and bring them to me. And if anyone stops you, now that word anyone, um, actually in the other translations it says, um, if the owner, small o, there's big O's and small O's. Big O's and small O's. And this is a small O. And he says, listen, if any small O asks you, hey, what do you want? He says, just tell them the big O, the Lord of all, needs them. You see, here, right here, is that we've got to settle who is the owner, the real owner. And as long as we think we're the owner of our life, as long as we think we're the owner of all that we have, as long as we think that we're the owner of our intellect, the owner of our business, the owner of everything, as long as we think we're the big O, the big, real big O, 
the Lord of all will not use us. But when we settle ownership, Lord of all, anything you want me to do, I do. What are you carrying? Are you carrying pride when God wants to you to have humility? Or are you trying to carry it and do it yourself? You want to make your own way. You want to make it yourself. You want to be the big O. You see, that's the very thing. That's where the enemy wants to use our humanity, the pride of life, to deceive us and pollute our hearts. And as long as that is there, we're never going to give birth to the plans and purposes of God. Is God the big O in your life? Is he the Lord of all? He says the Lord of all needs them. Now that word is not like God is sitting on the throne going, oh my goodness me, if this guy doesn't respond, I'm in trouble. God doesn't need in the sense of he's a needy person. That word actually means necessity or has a business for you. He has a plan for you. He created you. He formed you. He's put you in the circumstances, good and bad. He has used the pain and the pleasures of your life and all of those things to bring you to a place, but he wants to use you if you will let him untie you. I'm a disciple this morning. I'm coming into your village, and I'm going, I want to untie you so that you can begin to fulfill the purposes and plans that God has for you. But you're going to have to leave some things behind. You're going to have to leave the village and you've got to know is that God wants to use you in His way, what He needs you for, not what you want. And it says all this happened to fulfill the prophecy. Friends, you want the prophecies fulfilled? You want the dreams developed? You want the plans to come to fruition? This is it. What do they do? It says, tell Zion's daughter, look, your king arrives. He's coming to full." To full, he's coming to you full of gentleness, sitting on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. So what's happened is if you go back into Zechariah 9, you'll see there the prophet prophesies this. And he prophesies that the king of kings will come not on a horse, because a horse was the status you know, kings rode on a horse, and it would be the best horse that they could find. Today, they ride in Rolls Royce or Maseratis or whatever they want. They find the best, most expensive car, bulletproof it all, and the kings ride in it. And, and Jesus is not like that king. What he does is he comes on a donkey. No, actually, he doesn't choose the donkey. He chooses the dinky. How humble is that? the kindness and the humbleness of God that leads us to repentance. And I want to tell you, friends, that Jesus wants to ride on the dinkies. You young people, you guys in the first half of your life, especially the younger people, I want to tell you that the glory of God wants to come and ride into this city. Are you ready? What are you carrying? <laughs> now I want to change the question. Who are you carrying? Are you carrying you? Are you carrying your status? Are you carrying what you want? Are you carrying your dreams, your things? Or are you prepared to allow the Lord of all to get upon you? I don't know. But what about us in the second half of our lives? What about us, about us donkeys, the old ones? Are we prepared to walk alongside the young donkeys? So the two disciples went on ahead and did, say did, as Jesus instructed them. Friends, this is an issue of obedience. You know what I've found is that most people don't have a financial problem. They have an obedience problem. We don't have a marriage problem. We have an obedience problem. We don't have a life problem. We have an obedience problem. And if we could just learn to obey, I think a lot of our problems would go away. Maybe we should write that like a Learn to obey, problems go away. Learn to obey, problems go away. I know I'm useless at it, but now if we had a, a someone else that could do it better, maybe the glory of God would come upon that. And they brought the donkey and her colt to him and placed their cloaks and their prayer shawls on, their col on the colt, and Jesus 
road on. I wonder what happened at that moment in time. I, I'm not sure. I, I want to watch the movie in heaven one day because I can imagine, you know, here they bring the donkey and the colt and the, you know, the little colt is like, woo, 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 you know, it's jumping around and the old donkey's walking. And, and they take off their coats and they stick it on the old donkey because that's what was normal. And Jesus says, no, 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 the dinky. You going to ride on the dinky? Yeah, I'm going to ride on the dinky. Are you kidding? No, it's bad enough you're riding on a donkey. You're the king of kings. No, I'm going to ride on the dinky. And you see, God wants to do a new thing, and he's not going to ride on the old thing. And that's why we've got to say, God, would you give us, preach it. Would you help us break into something new? The biggest hindrance to the new is the old. And the reality is, I'm old. <laughs> and the biggest hindrance to you young people is me. Why? Because I've seen it, I've done it, and I want it, and I know it, and I think I'm an expert. And I've got to go in that place. I've got to go, oh, God, can you, can you, I just want, you know, it's, someone says this, that you've got to leave your pride at the door. Wanga, where are you? I tell you, God wants to use you young people in ways. And I, I'm dreaming of it. And I'm going, you know, I sat with a 75-year-old man this week. And I said to him, I said, you know, because when I was on holiday, I began to think, because I'm nearly 60. I never, ever thought I'd get to 60. I feel like 40, 35, 25, maybe. I don't, I mean, 60, that is like, that is old. That is flipping old. It's like ridiculous, you know. And I think, you know, and then I'm in Brazil, and, 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 and they've, you know, there's, there's just me, and, and then I'm getting there, and they're like, um, no, I said, we must put up the lights. They said, oh, no, you know, um, no, we can't do that. We don't have enough time. No, because you have time. Get the scaffolding. I'll get the scaffolding. I'm up there on the scaffold. I'm putting the lights in. No, no I'll do it. I tell you, the next day, I'm like, oh, God. It's like, flap. I realize I think I'm 40, but I'm nearly 60. And I go like, okay, so in my 60s, what should I be doing to make sure I get to 75? And I began to think, what is it? So here's a 75-year-old, and he's sitting in my office, and I said to him, and, and he's, a, he's, a lovely, he's a lovely man. He, he married Andy and I, named Ken Broom. And I said to him, Ken, what should I be doing in my 60s? You 75. What should I be doing in my 60s to make sure I get to be 75 like you? You see, this is the thing. I'm like, oh, okay, I don't know why I'm saying that, but that's for somebody too. Do you, you know, let's just put it here. Here it goes. Here. What, as a 20-year-old, in your 20s, in your 30s, who's, who's in their 20s? Okay. Who's in their 30s? Who's in their 40s? Who's in their 50s? Who's in their 60s? Who's in their 70s? Anybody? Okay, here's the deal. Is who are you sitting with? Who are you sitting with and asking, what should I be doing in my 20s to make sure I get well into my 30s? What am I doing in my 30s? If you're 30, what should I be doing in my 30s? You better be asking those, you see, because that's, that's where, you know what, I'm, and then I keep pinching ourselves and going like, why are there so many young people that want to be around us? Now, I know some people don't want to be around us. I get that. We're not, everybody doesn't love Craig. I know that. But there's some guys, it's just like, hey, they're on us. And there's these church planters, and they're 34, 35, and they're just like, hey, Craig, would you come? And they just want to have lunch and dinner with us. And we sit there, and we go like, why the heck do you want to be friends with us? We could be your parents. <laughs> and we just go, we're going to just, we revel in it. It's just like, we'll be the old donkey with next to the new donkey, you know? My friend is from Peter Marisburg, Grant Crawford. He phones me a couple of weeks back. He says, hey, Clarkie, 
He says, man, my young guys, and he leads a church of four, 5,000 people. He's part of an apostolic network of, uh, around the country, and this apostolic uh, team is having a youth conference. And he finds me, he says, Clarky, he says, my young guys have been stalking a young preacher that they reckon is a good guy. Uh, his name's uh, Warren, I think. <laughs> They've been stalking him. They've been listening to him preach. And he says, um, they want him to come and preach at their youth conference. So I said to him, no, he can't go, but I can. <laughs> what are the dates? <laughs> no, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. This old donkey said, woo -hoo! yeah, of course he can. But not when I'm not there. No, no. <laughs> I mean, guys, worship team, creatives. And he says to me, who put that preacher set together? I said, the guys did it. They just came in like, they're like, I just go, woo, come on, let's prophesy, let's do it, let's do it. Let's do it. I want to go, you know, here it is. I believe that God wants to bring a whole new move of his glory and his presence upon the young people. And if you young people would be, we were willing to take you see, this is the thing, is that their, 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 their coats was a status symbol. It's, it's kind of like when they put, had their coats on, it, it was like their status. That's how they showed their wealth. And as they took off their status and they took off their wealth and they put it on the dinky. They took off their prayer shawls, which was, represented the word of God, that which would cover them. And they put it on the dinky and they said, Jesus, you ride on it. And are we going to be prepared, young people, are you going to be prepared to be covered and be tethered to us older guys. I know it's not easy, and I know that we, you know, kind of may laugh at you or whatever it is, and you may want to wear jeans with full holes on it and all of that, and we don't quite get so skinny and da 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 da, da. But you know what I'm looking for? I'm looking for the glory of God to come and to sweep over the city. It says, then an exceptionally large crowd gathered and carpeted the road before him with their cloaks and prayer shawls. Now, now, you see, the disciples put their, those close to Jesus, put their jackets, put their prayer shawls onto him, and then people just followed. It was just like, oh, you can't put 2,000 uh, jackets on a little dinky, but you can throw it on the road to pave the way for the city. And what are we doing to pave the way so that the city can come in? And it's an exceptionally large crowd. And friends, I wanna tell you when the church settles ownership, when the church becomes obedient, when the church begins to get off its status and, and humble himself, when the church is prepared to let the King and the Lord of all get on our backs and we ride the King of glory into the city, an exceptionally large crowd will come together and hear the gospel. I know I'm preaching way better than you are responding. My wife, who's heard this already, is, a, is more vocal than you. What are you doing up here, young man? Yeah, you see, he's a young man. We'll just get tethered together here. Here we go, go. There's nothing. The, the anointing needs to come. Uh-oh. Nothing. Turn it on. Now we got it. Now we got it. Now we got it. Okay, another half an hour and we'll be done. It says, others cut branches from the trees, sped the path. Jesus rode in the center of procession. Crowds were going before him, crowds coming behind him. And they all shouted, bring the victory, Lord, Hosanna, son of David. He comes with blessings, being sent from the Lord Yahweh. We celebrate with praises to God. It says, Jesus entered Jerusalem, and the people went wild with excitement. You want to know why we go wild in this? You know, you're going to like, what is wrong with this church? It's loud. There's lights going, and they're dancing in the front here. Well, I tell you what, when Jesus comes into this place, then we go wild with excitement. And it says the entire city was thrown in an uproar. 
Someone asked, who is this man? And the crowd shouted back, I know I'm loud. I know I'm loud. I'm sorry. But sometimes there's just, you've got to be loud. I'm looking for a loud church. Not that we're just loud to be loud. I'm looking for the loudness of our hearts, which is overflowing with that Jesus is alive. It says, upon entering Jerusalem, Jesus went directly into the temple. And what he did is there were these merchants and they were selling in the very place that the Gentiles, it was this courtyard called Solomon's Porch. It was created so the Gentiles could come and worship God. But they had set up shop and they were stopping the Gentiles. And to see the church can stop people far from him coming to church. We can set up our own religious forms and our own religious ways. And the things is, and the people come in and they go like, I really want to know your God. But the way I see you is like you make it weird. And we want to be real, genuine, and authentic. And I know I've still got some religious about me. And I say, God, would you get rid of that pollution so that we could be real, genuine, authentic why? Because the world is desperate to see a Jesus, not a religious order. And so what he did is he drove them out. He said, my, place, my dwelling place will be known as a house of prayer. And it says then in verse 14, it says, the blind and the crippled came into the temple court. You see, they were keeping the blind and crippled out. Friends, when we get a revelation, when we get a revelation, that the King of glory wants to ride in us and He wants to give birth to the plans and purposes of God and that we are carrying Jesus. When we get that revelation, when we humble ourselves and settle the ownership, when we are prepared to carry Jesus into every situation, when we are prepared to make it easy for people to come to God, I tell you, the blind and the lame, that's significant in terms of blind, that they're blind to the gospel. They're lame. They're crippled. You're not walking through life. You're here this morning, and you go like, I don't know this God, but I want to know Him. You may feel like I'm really crippled, not physically, but emotionally in your heart that's been polluted through pain or pleasure, and you're desperate to meet this God. You've come to the right place because it says, and Jesus healed them all. And then the thing that I've, I've not, I've read it, I've seen it, but I never realized just how this relates to the story. It says this, and the children circled about him, shouting out, blessing and praises to the son of David. I want you to see is like Jesus is seated in this massive courtyard. There's the blind, the lame, they, they sing, they go, whoa, look there, there, wow, wow. The other ones are jumping up and down, they go, whoa, no longer crippled. But then what happens is the children come running in. And into that language, into that culture, it would have been the under 12s, kind of. And the children just start running around Jesus. Woo, son of David. Woo, Jesus. It's like the children have caught it. The young donkeys got it. What did the old donkeys do? No, they didn't. It says, but when the chief priests, the religious order, the scholars heard the children and saw the miracles. They heard the children's laughter. They heard the children's praises. They saw the wonderful things that Jesus began to do. And it says, they were furious. Don't think that when God starts to move, everybody loves it. And don't you think that you won't be like that because we're all like that. Our self-prejudice our self-righteousness, our self-importance. The pollutions of our hearts will get in there. And we, as we are, you may think, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to let the young donkey, the young dinkies, I'm going to let them worship. I'm going to let them preach. You're going to wait until that thing happens to you and see how insecure you may feel. 
Clocky, I want your young guy. Well, why don't you want me? You my friend. In fact, it says there that they seemed evil to them. This is the religious order. It seemed evil. It seemed, this was, I mean, miracles, blindness going, cripples walking, the children are loving Jesus. And the religious order says, nah, this is evil. Wow. What's the time? Jesus actually tells them, he says, he just quotes the scripture and he says, listen, the Old Testament told us that it's upon the praises of the young that he will be established. And it says he went back into the city and he went out and he spent the night and the next morning he came out and he's going back into Jerusalem and, and he comes across a fig tree full of leaves and he went to the fig tree and he found no fruit. So he just curses it. He says, may you be cursed. And the tree withered up right in front of them, from the roots up, just went. The disciples go, wow! It's a bit like Wonga's magic. Except it was really not magic, it was supernatural. Because he was trying to say to them, and he said, you will be barren and never bear fruit again. Because they had the leaves, this is the picture is that that fig tree looked like it should give fruit. It should have given fruit. But when he came to it, there was nothing. How, what are you carrying, friends? Are you carrying fruit? Has the enemy come and squeezed you, squeezed the very fruit out of you so that he's licked up your eggs, licked up the very plans and purposes of God and you've given up. What are you carrying? Are you carrying the plans and purposes of God or are you a fig tree and it looks all good? Oh, I've got a nice home, nice this, da, 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 da. but there's no fruit. And Jesus is coming to look at the fruit. What are you carrying? Because you ain't got fruit. He says you'll never, you'll be barren. And Jesus, I mean, the disciples were like, what? And Jesus replied, he said, if you have no doubt of God's power and you speak out of faith's fullness, say faith's fullness, you can be the ones who speak to a tree and it will wither away even more than that. He says, you can say to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea. That was, you. it was a, idiom of the day. They said, if you said, hey, you know, I can throw a mountain in the sea, it meant this, that you could overcome a seemingly impossible, unsurmountable difficulty. What difficulty are you facing? What mountain are you facing for your fruitfulness? What are you facing? What pain, what pleasure, what issue are you facing that is stopping you? And let me tell you, this is it. One of the greatest things the enemy is after is our faith. Because if he gets our faith, we cannot remove the mountains. We stay unfruitful. What are you carrying, friends, this morning? He says, everything you pray for with the fullness of faith, you will receive. I'd love you to go on and this afternoon, your homework is to read and finish the chapter and ask God to speak to you and the Holy Spirit to start a revelation within your hearts because right after that the authority of Jesus is, is tested and then he talks about the parable of two sons and the parable of the rejected son and he gets to the end and he, he speaks to these religious people he says this this is why I say to you that the kingdom realm of God will be taken from you and given to a people who will bear fruit. You know, that's to me one of the most humbling and I want to say scary, but I don't want to say his word is scary because this is it is that I never want to get to a place where I become so religious. I become such an old religious order that I cannot celebrate 
the glory of God on the young people and on the new generation and the things coming in. I'm dreaming. I'm dreaming of young and old carrying the glory of God. What are you carrying? Do you carry a deep desire to be fruitful? I want to finish just with this question. Am I carrying faith for more or a fear of loss? So I felt God challenged me. I was, am I carrying faith for more or am I carrying a fear for less or for loss? Am I a fruitless, disobedient fig tree or am I a faithful, obedient servant of the Lord of all? I know what I want to be. What do you want to be? What are you carrying? that God wants to give birth to. Who are you carrying that the city would say, I want that same Jesus. Can we stand together this morning? I don't wanna move on without allowing God to minister to you. I've done the best that I can, but I know that it's not in my ability, but it's in the Spirit's ability that I'm trusting in, that He would have spoken and giving birth, bringing salvation, bringing healing. And so just for a few moments, if we could just bow our heads in a moment of contemplation, what are you carrying who are you carrying are you tethered who's tethered to you I think it's time some old people those in us in the second generation go and look for some younger generation Who's tethered to you? Who are you tethered to? It's definitely, you're going to choose people. You're going to choose moments and situations. They're going to take you. Is it going to take you into the glory of God or is it going to take you away? Into a place of barrenness? I believe that God wants to untie some people this morning. Untie you from a village. I want to say if that's you this morning I want you to get out from where you are standing and allow the Holy Spirit I'm a disciple this morning and I'm coming to untie you and I don't know whatever the Holy Spirit has quickened to you in your spirit in your heart you know whether it's finances a business that relationship whatever it is and you know that you're destined for more you know that you're destined to carry the glory of God but you haven't been and there's a fresh beginning and there's a fresh new season and that you're wanting that and you're making that and you're letting me say okay Craig untie me I want you to get out from where you are and I want you to just come and stand down in the front I'm untying you from the village come on don't worry about what people think because if you're worried about what people think you're tied to a village it's time that you get set free to a city and you go like God I want the plans and the purposes I want you to give birth to those things come on come on Jesus Jesus. As you walk, as you come, just come forth, just come forward, let people come. There's many coming. Come on. Don't let the enemy steal this moment from you. Don't let a bear stand and take it out of your head or take those eggs. Don't let it. You older people in the second generation, come on. If you're a young person here this morning in your first day, you're young and you're wanting to preach, prophesy, you're wanting to worship, you're wanting to be. I don't care if you're on the worship team. Put down your instrument. Come and get untied. Come and stand here this morning. Say, God, I want to be used. Are you ready? Are there preachers here this morning that's just going, that's it. Give birth to those things. Allow God to come.
there's a battle. There's a battle. And I'm going to fight for it. Because I was in the meeting like this, and I never wanted to stand. And I said, I don't want to be a missionary, God. And God said to me, I don't want you to be a missionary. So I want you to be a church planner. And I wrestled, and I didn't want to stand. I'm so glad now that when I was 21 years of old age, I stood. And there's some 21-year-olds this morning who are in your 20s. And there's a wrestle and there's a battle going on. And I'm fighting for your future. And I'm saying, get out from where you are and come and respond to God right now this morning. Father, I want to thank you that you, this loving God and Father, have not discarded us, you have not thrown us away, but that you want to give us fresh new beginnings. And we come, Lord, this morning, and maybe full of pain and, and full of maybe disobedience, things that we haven't really followed you like we should have. But this morning, we ask you that, that you'd untie us from the village of our small thinking and that you'd fill us with the fullness of faith and the difficulties that we face in the insurmountable situations, we ask you, oh gracious God, would you throw those mountains into the sea? Would you cause this fig trees, these which you have planned and purposed to give fruit, would you cause them now to be fruitful in the name of Jesus? And I speak fruitfulness over you. I speak the glory of God. I speak the ownership of Jesus. I speak the future and the plans of God. And there is someone here this morning that can't fall pregnant physically, in the physical. Anybody here battling to fall pregnant? There. Anyone else? Father, I thank you that fruitfulness will come now in your beautiful name, Jesus. That you, the author of life, that they would give birth in the natural, but it will also be in the spiritual, a, a birthing of a prophet like John the Baptist, oh God. That out of barrenness, fruitfulness will come right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Seed of heaven birth in them your fruitfulness for your glory and honor and we give praise and honor come on let's thank God for the fruitfulness that's come Jesus begin to do something